Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the fifth edition of the hashtag Slinky Think sessions. Uh, welcome and thanks for taking a little bit of time out of your lunch today to join us. Uh, today's going to be hosted by the one, the only Chris Daly. There's probably more than just one Chris Daly's in the world, but um, you're going to have the uh, the experience of the especially agile Chris Daly today. So. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the power of tribes within agile team culture, uh, learning how to identify your tribes and why leveraging natural groups matter. So uh, let's do a quick little intro about Be Life and what we do. So as you can see in our tagline, we are about people, culture, and agile. We truly believe that to transform organizations that have a more agile mindset, you have to start with individuals first. And so that's why it's really important for us to to have people as the beginning of our tagline. Uh, and that's why we love providing webinars such as this, because we, we really want to empower individuals just like you to start thinking in sort of an agile mindset to be able to be um, those transform, transformational instigators for your organizations and beyond. So as I mentioned earlier, um, how are we empowering individuals and organizations? Well, that's by introducing Agile methodologies and people focused practices. Our hashtag is kind of fun. It's hashtag slinky think. Chris is old school, not old, just old school. And he likes to call this pound sign slinky think. So we have a running gag about uh, the generational divide between what that symbol is at the beginning. But the reason that we use slinky think is because our logo is a slinky, which signifies being agile. And slinky think is not only our extension of us thinking in an agile sort of mindset, but also your extension as well. So I'll remind you at the end of the webinar today, but if there's any big takeaways you get from today's webinar, just jot that down maybe on a piece of paper or on your phone somewhere. And we'd love for you to uh, write that quick little post anywhere on social media and then tag it, uh, hashtag slinky thing. So we know that you're uh, absorbing some of these super great agile ideas. Team Slinky Think, Chris Daly, Managing Director, and yours truly, the Marketing Director. So while you're here today, the goal of the webinar, you're gonna gain the tools to identify your tribe, and most importantly, how to elevate from one level to the next to empower and continuously develop the individuals that compose your team. So before I hand it over to Chris, uh, a couple of notes. If you do have to jump out early, uh, that's totally fine. We're going to have a recording of this session that we will get to you ASAP right after today's webinar is complete. If you do have any questions, feel free to ask them via the chat uh, and we will answer them uh, as quickly as possible. But this is going to be an interactive session. So we're going to have a few moments uh, during the session for you to contribute. If you're busy working on something else or just chewing, that's totally fine too. Like I said, we'll send you uh, the video in just a little bit. So without further ado, oh, cool. Uh, so today's agenda, um, people network model, right? So the first thing we're gonna talk about is uh, how to better understand your workplace culture. Um, we talked earlier about empowering individuals to really embrace the agile mindset to therefore uh, create agile uh, organizations. But you're going to find that people will clump together based on core values or just other similarities. And so we're going to talk about um, workplace culture and, and, and define what these quote unquote tribes are. The second part, we're going to talk about what's your stage and we're going to uh, dive into how to identify which stage of culture your team is currently in. And then number three, this is the here's what you came for section. Uh, we're going to give you some tools and tips and tricks uh, to help empower your teams and empower your culture. And the one thing I will say, and we say this all the time with any event we're at, is we do not provide a silver bullet solution to helping organizations become more agile. So a lot of what we're going to provide for you today are, are suggestions. It's really a lot of food for thought. And as I mentioned in, in the fourth section, 
if you leave this workshop with more questions and answers, do not feel overwhelmed, but that's okay. We're really just trying to get you to think about what this all means and how you can apply it uh, to your teams. And if you do have any questions, as I mentioned earlier, hit us up in the chat function and we'll be more than happy to, to help out. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do before I hand it over to Chris um, is we're gonna break the ice. Uh, so I have a funny icebreaker. I was at a meeting this morning and um, this isn't directly related to our session today, but I just thought this would be a fun thing to talk about. Um, I'll, I'll, let me backstep a quick second here. You notice that I put hints, we're not gonna talk about work. I think far too often at meetings we have icebreakers that only talk about what we're doing as an organization, when really we should be getting to know each other on a personal level and not what's your favorite color, what's your favorite movie, what's your favorite food to eat, you know, go, go a little bit deeper than that. So my question for you, this one's kind of fun, uh, because I saw someone this morning who was texting and actually brushing their hair at the same time while they were driving, which uh, was a little annoying for me. So I'd like for you to put in the chat and just, write a couple sentences or a, a couple of words, whatever it may be, of what is the weirdest thing you've seen someone doing while driving? And I have a bad habit of eating while I drive, so I will admit that I am not, uh, I'm at fault as well for, for um, I'm also a drummer, so I like to just tap on the, on the dash quite often. <laughs> Jeff asks, this is a family friendly chat, right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, shaving, electric shaver from Don, putting on makeup. Yeah, that would, that, that, those were two of the big ones this morning that I heard at my meeting. Someone mentioned that they saw someone actually brushing their teeth and rinsing their mouth while driving. So go figure. So anyways, this is silly. Uh, but the reason I, I, I love these kind of icebreakers is, is because this fosters a, a conversation more than just, hey, what's your favorite food? You know, this, this gets you to start thinking about, oh, okay, well, if you see someone who's shaving with an electric shaver, uh, it might bring up a conversation about how it's important to leave uh, for meetings on time and be punctual. Uh, I don't know if Chris is snarking or laughing right now, but I have a tendency to be uh, consistently two or three minutes late if I'm lucky to about every meeting I've been to. So um, once again, this can be a really fun way to just instigate some fun conversations, get people talking uh, and get, get the blood flowing. Uh, Lisa puts, she saw someone actually reading a newspaper while driving, uh, which is really funny because that's almost like old school texting while driving, right? It's like an analog version of that. So um, Lisa, if you're listening, let us know what news, did you see, if you saw what newspaper, style of newspaper they were reading, if it was like the New York Times, maybe that'd be better than the National Enquirer. Okay, so enough of breaking the ice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Chris Daly to get this party started. There we go. Okay, so... Um... One of the things we want to talk about and, and, and explore a little bit today is what causes your Agile projects to fail? And the reason we ask that question, the reason I ask that question, is because we have a fundamental belief that most Agile transformations or most any kind of transformation, for that matter, not just Agile, fails because the people aren't trained and don't have the skills to do what you're asking them to do. So what are some of the, so what we wanna do now is, let us know in the chat, what are some of the struggles you have within Agile? What are some of the things that, that cause you problem? Or for that matter, cause you problems when you're just trying to run a, a, a new project, right? What are those, what are some of those challenges? So if you throw that in the chat, that'd be great. Uh, 
All right. So we'll, we'll move on while you respond and we'll come back. So what we're going to talk about, as Drew said, what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the people network model um, is one of the things we're going to talk about. We're really talking about the power of tribes. When you, when you think about your organization, most organizations vary in size. They can vary anywhere from two people to you know, tens of thousands of people. So how, how does an organization get its way? How does it get to what it's about? And what, we've, what the research shows is that we as humans typically deal in a number between 20 and 150. 150 is the absolute max. Once we get to that size, once we get to more people that are around us, we typically see the group start to break up a little bit. Um, and, and that kind of goes back to what Google tried to do with um, their friends, what Facebook's do, trying to do about your inner circle, where they're talking about how, how many people do you actually interact with? And that's what we're going to explore a little bit, and then how you, move, how you move the needle with those folks. So culture is a big indicator of that, right? Culture is in spite of what a lot of people think, culture is really the sum of the actions of the behaviors of the people that are in the organization. That it is what we see in terms of what's acceptable behavior and what's not. And you know, when, we, when I first started uh, diving into culture and into teams, what, one of the things I found that was amazing was that we are all members of groups. And we're not just members of one group. We're all members of multiple groups. And if you, I, and I just threw some icons up here. You know, we all have very, there are various ways that we will um, join those, those tribes or those uh, clubs, if you want to call them that. You know, the, you think about the organizations like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Um, you think about organizations like, you know, sports organizations, the Patriots, the Colts, the Steelers, where they've got those national followings. And you see people wearing their Steeler shirts when, they're, when they live in California or when they live in Indianapolis. Um, you know, and the reason they do that is because they want to be part of that group. Going to a game or going to a sporting event, people want to be a part of a bigger organization. Um, if you think about organizations like Apple, right, there's an Apple tribe if they're, you know, where people go out and that's all they buy, right? Drew owns everything Apple, including he's probably got Apple shoes on right now. But they follow it because they like what it does. They either like the fact of what it stands for or they like the, the benefits of being there, the outcomes, or they like it because they're comfortable with it. Um, our organizations, such as Angie's List, uh, which was where I used to work, or BeLife, those could be considered tribes those and and those should be considered tribes if you're if you have a leader um a good strong leader um the last one on this particular slide is we also have clans you know and this this idea of tribes or clans goes back to long before there was a written history um the one that you see right there is the daily um, um logo from ireland years ago right and and we all ascribe to all of us come from somewhere like that, come from some background like that where we've got a family that, that we use. Um, you know, the, the, in the Daly's case, they even have their own quilt, or not quilt, quilt kilt, and their own pattern that they use for, um, you know, for their tartans. And, and so it, it's important that we identify who, what tribes we're with, and we understand that we're in multiple tribes depending on what we're doing. So the science behind it, right? The science tells us that, again, that, that we need to be in groups and that we need to tribe. Fish, for example, school. Buffalo herd. People actually tribe. People get into tribes. They've done it for years, and, they, and they'll continue to do it. We've done it since the dawn of man. And, and everyone wants to be part of a tribe. If you can point out somebody to me who says, oh, I don't want to be a part of a tribe. I want to be a solo. I want to be a solo. I don't, I don't belong to anybody. They probably do. Um, you know, when I think about um, 
the different organ, different people as you're walking down the street, right? You'll see folks who maybe have, um, have, have different kinds of hats or they wear the same kind of clothes or they have tattoos on their arm that represent the same thing. People want to be part of that tribe and the science shows us that. The, the tribe, the power of tribes allows us to be able to, um, to survive, right? To, to move forward by having a tribe of people that we associate with our kindred spirits and can count on and depend on that gives us the ability that we can withstand a lot. We can withstand, um, we can uh, withstand catastrophes. We can withstand, um, troubled times. We can help each other out as we go. Um, we're not always thinking about our individual selves. We're thinking about the tribe as a whole. So enough about tribes. Let's talk a little bit about the stages of culture or the stages of a tribe. So there are five stages to the tri to, that a tribe could be in. Um, and creatively, um, the authors of the book um, tribal leadership, named them stage one through five. Um, we, in this chart that you see, we also describe the behavior and the language that people use. So stage one is, you know, dis disparating hostility, right? These are the folks that are um, the, in gangs that are um, maybe typical to be, maybe susceptible to suicide or susceptible to rattle, rattles, radicalization. I can't even talk today. Radicalization. Basically, their approach is everything about life sucks, right? It's just, there's nothing redeeming here. There's nothing good about it. I'm just going to look out for myself. I don't care about anybody else. I don't care about what I am, who I impact. Stage two is more of your apathetic victim. They're the ones that say, my life sucks. You know, everything else, there's opportunities. I see hope here, but right now my life sucks. Things don't go well. It doesn't have anything to do with me. You know, cry me a river, the folks that, that just can't get, just always down, just can't seem to, to get out of it. Stage three is the lone warrior. This is the one that we describe as I'm great. This is where when you hear organizations say, we only hire the best. We only hire the best technology people or we only hire the best salespeople. That's what they're saying. We are great. Not everybody else is great, but we are great. And when you do that, you get folks that are looking out for themselves. You know, you'll see that in organizations where folks will go out and maybe the project failed, but they'll point to all the good things that they did. Even though the project failed, right, and, and, and it was a complete and utter disaster, they did great, they did great work. And they always find, uh, they always find a way to point to themselves as being the one that does the good work, the one that's always needed, the invaluable one. Stage four is tribal pride. That's where we're great. That's where we want to get our agile teams, if we're talking about agile and scrum. We want, we want it to be where the team is looking out for, for the whole team, not just individuals. Um, they, they begin to believe in each other. They begin to trust each other. They start moving forward in a way where they're caring about each other. They develop empathy. And when you get to that stage, which that's stage four, that's a pretty cool spot to be in. Um, the, when I think about my positive ex life experiences at work, it's usually when we're, my team is, that I'm working on is at stage four and that things are going really well. We're all working together. We all seem to be just about to the point where we're finishing each other's sentences. Um, where we're accomplishing a lot and it, it makes it real easy as a leader to kind of get out of the way when you've got when you've got that a team at that stage you just get out of the way and let them work and let them do their job and let them create let them do great things so that's a that's where we want to be stage five is is where um, life is great right now most organizations uh, most teams hardly ever get there this is where you've seen them where they just they work together and they go forward and they're not completing each other's sentences they're they're completing each other's thoughts they actually understand how they all think they all contribute they all 
pal around together. They're successful. And it seems like, you know, you hear, you'll, you'll see teams where it's like, how do they, how are they so good? And they can't really explain it to you. That's stage five. And that is, that's about 5% of the population. So before I go any further, I want to, I thought it was important to talk about this quote from George uh, Box. All models are wrong, some are useful. So this is a model, remember that as we go forward, this is a model. This is not a, as Drew said, this is not a process you follow or a step-by-step, play-by-play. This is actually just a model. And you'll have to tweak it. As you go forward, you should be iterative on it and tweak it. Um, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to make some, you're going to do some things from time to time that might not work out, but stick with it. Remember that, that um, you know, this is just a guide for you. It's not the, the end all be all. Um, you know, when we talk about words, you know, and we listen to people talk, our words are really our reality. They're really what we, they represent what we say. And sometimes when I'm going into an organization, I will, I will parse their words and say, well, what did you mean by, what do you mean by the term life? Or what do you mean by when somebody says, you know, we, we, do, the, we do a certain thing? What does that really mean? Because words represent reality. And if they're using, if people are using negative words, if they're using words that, that, that are not constructive, that convey a negativity to it, then odds are that they're coming from a negative place inside of them. If they're using encouraging words or positive words, then they're probably coming from, they prob that's probably represents how they feel inside. It's positive, we're moving forward, we've got hope, we like what's going on, we think things are going well. So taking that into account, when we talk about stage one, right, we, again, you hear words like life sucks, this is impossible. I can't see the end of this. You hear th those words come out and they, they, tell you, they give you an indication. And when you hear them over and over again out of someone or out of a team, then you start to understand that that's where they're at. And it, it can be, it's important that we as leaders understand that, that we're listening to the words that are out there. When we get to stage two with the apathetic victim, they're going to use a lot of, of terms that talk about this sucks, right? They're going to, they're going to say things like management's got it out for me. Steve's, Steve's picking on me. I don't understand why this won't work. It works for everybody else. I'm being passed over. I'm being passed over because I wore the wrong color baseball hat or I've got on a bad sweat. I've got on a sweatshirt that they don't like. They're always, it's always somebody else's fault. It's not the world's going to end, which stage one is, but it's really that it's not my fault, poor me, what was me. So you want to listen, as a leader, you want to listen to those words. You want to listen when you get into meetings with a team, listen to what kind of words that each team member is talking about. How are they, how are they communicating during their, stand, if, they're, if you do stand-ups, how are they communicating? What are the, what's the tone in the retrospectives if you're doing scrum? Listen to those terms and understand and try to interpret where the team is at. Stage three is the I'm great and you're not. Look what I did. I accomplished this. I deserve a promotion. I deserve a raise. Boy, without me, you wouldn't, this wouldn't have got this far. Those kind of words in stage three are what you hear out of somebody who is thinking about themselves. They are focused on their, on themselves. They're having some successes, but they're focused on themselves and they really don't care about anybody else. They, they really don't care about the team. All they're interested in is the next promotion or the next raise or the next opportunity. Um, you know, the, early in my career, we described these people as the ones that climb over the bodies of everybody else to get to where they want to get, right? They don't care. They just, move ahead and they're only interested in themselves. So in stage four, you're gonna, you're gonna hear the language switch. In stage three, we heard a lot of I, a lot of me. In stage four, you're gonna hear a lot of we. We're gonna hear a lot, you're gonna hear a lot of you. 
you're going to hear a lot of pointing at, maybe even pointing out, hey, look what Drew did, or look what Steve did, look what Johnny did, right? You're going to hear humble leaders who are not going to be saying, you know, they're going to be bragging about everybody else, not themselves. They're going to be standing up for everybody else. They're more of the servant leader type approach. And that's what we want in leaders. That's what we should strive for for leaders to get our teams to stage four. How do we get them? How do we serve them? How do we help them? And by serving them and helping them, we can help lift them up. We can help move them forward. Stage five is life is, is, is again, life is great. And we tend to, we tend to, we tend to be envious of these teams, right? These folks that just seem to be able to, to go from one thing to the other, to the other, and everything works and everything's wonderful. And, and, you know, they, they can, they seem to be able to do no wrong. So you can listen, as a leader, you can listen to that and listen to, to the language that's coming out of your team and what they're saying. And that will tell you a lot about where they're at. So one of the questions I, I typically get, if this were a live class, classroom or workshop, I would get the question, well, how many, how's this break down? How does it break down into the various, uh, into the, the a composition or percentage of the teams that are out there. And you'll see that a majority of the folks are in stage three. That by far is the largest, it's almost 50%. Stage two is around 25, 26%. Stage four is 23%. Stage one and stage five are right around three or 4%. So as you look at this and we talk about, we, and you, you see the propaganda that's out there, about high performing teams. Do this, read this book and you'll become a you'll become a high performing team. Do this process, you'll become a high performing team. Buy this tool and you'll become a high performing team. Looking at this, if it were that easy, you would expect to see more folks over on the in stage four than in stage three. A lot of this goes back to the fact that specifically in stage three, we're looking at hiring the greatest. We're looking at hiring people that think they're great. We hire the best coders, or we hire the best accountants. We hire, go out and hire somebody who has a great track record, right? Is a great PO, product owner, or maybe they're a manager, director, but yet we don't dig into the, how did they get there? How did they do it? What was it, was it part of a team effort, or did they, or were they just in it for themselves? How does that work? And, that, and so we find that a lot. We find a lot of that in organizations. And frankly, our compensation systems don't, that they actually reinforce this for the most part. We reinforce it, by, we, we reinforce it by giving you bonuses and increases and promotions based on how you did, based on how good of a developer you are, or how good of a manager you think you are, or how good of a VP you are, without taking into account how you got there, right? What were the outcomes? Did we build the organization up or did we run the organization into the ground and trying to get to that next promotion? So we're gonna talk next about how do you move your tribes? So if you find out that you're in one of these tribes, that let's say it's down here, you inherit a tribe that's in stage two or stage three, what do you do? How do you move them forward? How do you get them to where they get to stage three or stage four. Contrary to popular opinion, a team is not stuck in a stage or is not stuck as, well, that's just the way that team is. You don't have to accept that. As a leader, you don't have to accept that. You can, you can actually do some things to try and help your teams move forward. So to move tribes the whole to a different stage, the entire tribe has to move. And you have to have critical mass. It can't just be one individual, one person on that team moves forward and everybody else stays back. It, you have to move everybody forward in a critical mass to be able to get to that next stage. And when you start doing it, you're gonna probably, it's probably gonna follow some sort of a J curve. So it's gonna go, your team morale may go down a little bit. How they approach things will go down, may go down a little bit as you start trying to nudge them forward. But then eventually it's gonna come back up. Um, 
And then the other thing is if your team's not prepared, a team can move back down, back to a, back a stage based on stress. So based on a heavy project, maybe tight deadlines, maybe management, you know, ignores their agile training and starts picking dates and making work uh, overtime mandatory, whatever those things are, groups can actually move back down under stress. And, and that's another important point. Groups just don't get to stage four or stage five and stay there. They move based on the composition of the team, what's going on where in their personal lives as well as in their work life. So to upgrade your team, first of all, you as a leader need to start paying attention to how people talk. You need to, we need to do something new and revolutionary for managers and leaders. We need to start listening. And not just listening to those above us, but we need to listen to those below us. Those below us, listen to me. To those of us that we work with. We need to listen to our peers and hear what's going on. Right and and listen, be willing to listen to people at every single level. In some cases, you may have somebody who is a level two, and in reality, all they need to do is just have somebody show them that they've got confidence in them, listen to them, that they care about them. You can do so much from that standpoint. But to get there, you have to start listening and you have to start paying attention to where they are. You can try to nudge them up a level by starting to think about how you structure things with them, how you go in and what kind of opportunities you give them. What kind of recognition do you give as a leader? How do you empower them? How do you enable them? What kind of coaching do you give them? So we as leaders can nudge people up and nudge up by nudging up the individuals. We can also nudge up a tribe up to the next level. And you can't, a tribe can't go and skip levels. It doesn't, go from you can't go from a level one tribe to a level four tribe overnight you have to go up and nudge them up through the through the levels if you try to jump levels and you try to to get them to a level four from a level two you're going to come across as n not being authentic not being genuine right so you need as a leader you need to be thinking about and focusing on how do i get a nudge each team uh, each individual up a level and again, going back to, to our concept is why we formed this company. We believe that it's the individuals that are the most important. The sum of how our individuals are is what makes our organization great and what moves us up from level to level, level to level, and what accomplishes those great, those great big goals we want to give for them. So when you're, when you're moving from stage one to stage two, we want to create awareness. We need to start talking about, um, you know, the things going on around those folks. We need to get them to pay attention. Start pointing them to other people. Maybe somebody who is, is at stage three that was at stage one, right? And, and get them to start paying attention to that. Um, you know, and, and from your own standpoint, you can, do, you can do a lot of, you can give a lot of help to somebody by sharing your own experiences, right? Where you were down in the dumps and where you had problems and where you were a level one. Um, I know that I've, I've had points in my career where I've, I thought this was it. I'm done. I'm going to end up, I'm going to end up, you know, digging a ditch or something like that um, because I'm just going to fail. But you eventually get out of it, right? People help you get out of it by telling you stories. If you relay your own experiences to them, you're going to start building a bond with that person that's at level one. You're going to start showing, demonstrating empathy for them. And you're going to build that relationship. And that help will help them move up. You can start introducing them to the concepts of level two, right? Start talking to them about, you know, how things around them aren't so bad. There are opportunities. There are ways forward. They can be successful. Typically as well, you'll find that somebody that's at level one has a, um, has a network or has a, a group of people in their tribe that are dragging them down, um, that are holding them back. That's why sometimes you'll see people will leave a job, a great job, 
what appears to be a great job because the tribe is just holding them back. It won't allow them to do something. It won't allow them to go forward. If you, you know, thinking back to um, some of the things I've heard about alcoholism, right? You cut your ties. You don't, you don't want alcoholics going to the bar every night, right? And being around it. You want to change that environment. You want to get with different people who are doing the modeling, the right behavior that, that you want to have. So we want to encourage them to, to, move forward and to cut those ties, if you will. When you're going from stage two to stage three, that's where you start building the two-person relationship, right? You start out with talking about pairing them up with somebody, giving them a mentor, giving them somebody that can counsel them. Maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody within your team that has, that, that, has moved up into that level three, but we want them to start building relationships. We want them to feel like that they've got somebody that's willing to help them. Um, we want to show them the impact of their work. How does their work do? What, the, what benefit does their work do? Um, and what impact does it have on what we're trying to accomplish? It, somebody who does work that doesn't understand the benefits of it is going to think nobody cares. They're not going to take pride in it because they think, eh, if this doesn't get done, nobody's gonna, no, nothing's gonna happen, right? There's, nobody's paying attention. Um, you know, we also, you also should think about work that where you're starting to delegate some authority and responsibility to them. Doesn't require, would, it can require some follow-up, but you don't want it to be excessive. You don't want it to be, you wanna give them, ta give them opportunities and tasks where they can go off and they can do it themselves with a little bit of feedback from, from you or a little bit of follow-up, but you want to give them that opportunity to have some successes, to be able to point to something that says, I did that, and to feel pride in what they're doing. Um, we want to start introducing those stage three connections as well. You want to point them when you, you know, I mentioned about encouraging your two-person relationships. Try to encourage a two-person relationship with somebody in stage three. Right? Somebody who is where they want to be. We do this in business a lot. You see this a lot of a lot with um, when when you get into s small startups. You'll see this where a the CEO or the president, if they're relatively new to a leadership position, will the a, a VC or an investor will take them under their wings and start you know mentoring them and showing them and talking about where they need to go. Same kind of concept here when you're talking about nudging from stage three. You know from stage two to stage three. Anything going on in the chat? The, uh, the only comment I wanted to, and I mentioned this in the chat, but Jeff, uh, when you asked Chris earlier about what are some challenges you're having with agile culture, and Jeff mentioned uh, one line he hears is that we've always done it that way, which I think is something that we hear a lot the excuse to, to not be innovative and to not be agile. Well, it's, we've always done it that way and it's, and it's good enough. So yeah, we, uh, we feel you a lot on that, Jeff. That's, that, that rings very true for us for sure. Yep. We hear that. I hear that a lot and it's not just unique to my current clients. I've been hearing it over the years. I mean, it's always that way. So when we're going from stage three, to stage four, we start talking about wanting to encourage triads. We want to start being that connector. When we talk about triads, we're talking about somebody being able to introduce somebody to somebody else. For example, if um, you hear somebody's looking, occasionally if you hear somebody's looking for a job, right, and, and they're looking for their next opportunity, do you introduce them to somebody else who might be able to help them? Do you take that upon yourself? That's really what we're talking about when we talk about encouraging formation of triads. It's almost like you're the connector. You're the glue that starts to hold your tribe together. And it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody in connecting one person in the tribe to another person in that same tribe. It could be that you know somebody in another tribe and you're gonna connect them over. Um, so that you start building those connections across the tribes. And as you go and do that, 
what you're actually doing is you're, you're actually building your own tribe. You're building your tribe and you're, you're thinking about the individuals that are there and have empathy for them and are connecting them. And you're not thinking about yourself. And that's the, that's the best place to be in from my standpoint. Um, when you get, when you're trying to nudge them from stage three to stage four, give them work they can't do on their own. Give them some stuff where they got to be a team player. Um, you can really tell a lot by an individual when a superstar, when you put them in a team and, and, and chaos emerges, what's going on there. And it's important that you, um, it's important that you, that you help them through that and they learn how to play well with others when they have to. Um, so you want to try to do that. You want to try to set that work style or you want to try to set that up um, so that they, they work together. Um, you know, you want to talk about differences in styles. You want to become aware of that everybody's got their own style. And just because I've always done it this way doesn't mean that I'm always going to, that that's the way it should be. Right. We want to be, we want to be looking at other stuff. We want to be looking at how other people do their work and encourage them to go do it. We want to encourage, we want to be open about communication and collaboration. We want to talk about that. We want to, we want to, we want to talk about how we communicate. We want to be intentional in what we're doing. We just don't want to be uh, blathering on about stuff, but we want to be in, intentional about what we're communicating and how we're communicating. We don't want to over communicate, but by the same token, we also want to make sure that we've got ourselves, that we're communicating where we're at, where we're going and what we're doing. You want to start moving toward that, um, that concept again of, of full on servant leadership, right? We're, we're going to encourage, we're going to celebrate the wins. We're going to celebrate the, the opportunities or the failures as learning opportunities. And we're going to tell people about that. And we're going to be upfront and honest. And we want to tell, we want to talk about our transition. We want to talk about the fact that we are trying to get to become a high performing team. When you start to talk about becoming a high performing team as you're transitioning from one stage to the other, you want to talk about where we've come from. It's real easy for us to get short sighted and, and have short memories um, about where we've come from because we're so focused on the end goal. We don't take the time to look back and say, Hey, We've overcome a lot here. We've, we've accomplished a lot. And that's important as you go forward to celebrate those victories and recognize that even if things slow down, even if you can't get from stage three to stage four, even if it takes longer than what you think, it's important to talk about that where you're coming from and recognize that we have made progress. If you don't do that, you run the risk that you slide back into stage three. So you want to talk about that transition. You want to keep it in front of everybody. You don't want to lose sight of it. And at this point, we want to, I want to talk about the crucible experience. It's, you know, the, the quote here, I am because we are. This is uh, the crucible experience is where you're forced to have you're forced into a situation where you have to look and you have to depend on others. You have to be reflective uh, on what you're doing and how you're approaching things. And under, you start to understand that my greatest gift is that I'm enabling everybody else. My successes don't come from the fact that I create a spreadsheet or I write a great program. It comes from the fact that I got, out of the way and I created an environment where my team could be could show what their what they can do what their what their successes are what their skills are and I've also given them an environment that they can develop in so this crucible experience happens um, happens when you when you get into stage four I've had, I can tell you that I have a, it seems like I have a crucible experience. It seems like about every four or five years where I'm moving along and I think things are going and, you know, we're, things are going well for me. And then I start sliding down. Um, something happens, a company gets sold, whatever it might be. And something happens that comes along that just makes you, makes me sit up and take stock in where I'm at and realize that I can't, 
I can't do this by myself. I have to have people that can help me. And I'm sure that you're all, that, that all of you on this uh, webinar have the same thing. You have that experience where you can't do it without yourselves. If you're a QA manager, you can't run all the tests. If you're a marketing person, you can't do all of the activities that are required for the marketing, for a marketing organization, the, for Eli Lilly. You just can't do it all. And if you try to do it all, you're never going to get past your own capabilities. Your team's never going to exceed what you personally can do. So think about it for, think about this as you leave this webinar. What's your crucible experience? What's your thing that's, as a leader, that you recognize, hey, wait a minute, because at this point I recognize that I can do better, I can, can enable a team to go forward and achieve, a, you know, 10x more than what I could achieve by myself. That's the crucible experience. So as leaders, um, again, we want to start nudging people and the tribe to the next stage. We want to pull the center of gravity toward a higher stage. We want to find those champions, those leader, the, the other leaders in our tribe, and we want, to start, we want to start encouraging them to come up with us. We want to start encouraging them to talk, uh, to start using the right language, to start using, to, to have the right behaviors. And to, and to start encouraging others to do that as well. If you can get to where you can get some mass behind you, if you can get to where it's more than just you, where there's two or three uh, of you that are maybe leaders in your uh, tribe that are doing this, that are move, trying to move it forward, you'll be surprised how quickly others take notice. One of the things that's key to a culture is that people pay attention to the leadership. And if the leaders act a certain way, then all the folks that work with them will as well. And so that, so it's important you as a leader start to, to embrace the next level, start using the right language, start having the right behaviors, and then encourage your peers to go ahead and join you in doing that. So to stabilize a, at stage four, you really have to get to values and you have to get to a core, core, um, core values. You need to get a purpose, a mission. Why are we here? What is it we're trying to, what is it we're trying to do? What is it we stand for, right? Do we stand for, do we stand for transparency or do we stand for accountability? Are we going to be honest? What is it? What are those core values that we drive that, that carry us forward? What's our purpose-driven approach that we're going to take to work every day, right? Is it, what, what is it? And you have to, if you can get that and establish what that is, then you can start and you can start applying those values against everything you're doing. And your team can start applying it against what they're doing as well. You move away from having to tell them what to do to enabling them based on those values. Based on the value of honesty, should we be saying, should we be not communicating where we're at on this project status report? Based on where we're at, should we stand up and be honest when they ask us questions, right? And answer their questions directly and not be evasive. For me, this hit home when, um, Right, it was a weird year. It was 2001, and it was right after um, it was right after 9/11, and we had an opportunity. An opportunity. We had a. a we were going to do a reduction in force, and I was directed to be able to to go ahead and have a certain number of my team um, that were going to be unemployed on a Tuesday. The week before, we had a team meeting, and I actually had one gentleman ask me, are we going to have a riff? And I did what every young manager does. I lied and said no. And four days later, of course, we had a riff. And four days and two minutes later, I had lost the trust of my team, of my tribe. It took me a year and a half before I really felt like they trusted me again. 
So establish what your values are. Establish them with your team and then use those values again to, to apply against how you're going to behave, how you're going to act, and how you're going to do business. And then your team will follow. So again, here are the stages of uh, culture. We're going to go back and revisit that, right? So we've added a new column. Um, when we talk about specifically relationship to values, so when we have values, when we establish what those values are, people that are in stage one will try to undermine those values, right? They'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll do what they can to make sure that the values aren't um, adhered to, that they don't, they're not represented well. In stage two, folks are going to talk about they're ineffective, right? They're going to talk about how. Um, they're going to talk about, well, we've got these values and, you know, nobody lives, nobody lives up to them. We've got these group that are posted on a, a plaque in our conference rooms everywhere, but yet our leadership's not doing it. Our leadership's not following them. It's a joke. Um, we may even go as far as to put it in the annual report or put it on our website, but they're ineffective at best. Stage three is they're useful, right? So values are useful. They're attractive um, to those folks, to, to those folks um, that are in stage three, to those teams that are in stage three. And it can, um, it, they start, you start recognizing that values do actually contribute to where, to where you want to go. In stage four, they become important. They become what you stand for. They become what you, um, the way you decide what you're going to do. You know, do it, at work, does your organization pass on work that it feels like doesn't allow, that you can't be successful, that it won't support your values? Do your actions as, as teams, do they become important? Um, are they important from the standpoint that you're applying your values against them? And then stage five, they're vital. They're what you live, they're, they're what you live by, they're what you represent. Um, a lot of times we'll hear companies even that we think will be in a stage five that will do something that will betray their trust with us and they'll actually move down um you know toyota with the prius and the the brakes um a couple years ago is a good example of that where they were in stage four stage five and now all of a sudden folks are you know people are starting to question what their values are what kind of company is it so we want to make sure that we live by those values and that we um, we support them and we understand how they're going to apply to us. So the takeaway, um, we've got a Margaret Mead quote here, is that, you know, a small group of people that are committed can make a change and can do that. They can go in and they can make a change. They can change the world. And um, it's important to remember that. If, you're, if you are part of a tribe and that tribe is a stage two and you, want, you think you want the organization to go to stage three and you want to help do that, lead that charge, find other folks that share that same desire. Band together. Start, start talking about how... Watch, start watching what language you use and how you behave. And are you embracing the, the stage that your tribe's at? And are you going to be moving people up, right? Are you going to bring people with you to try to get there? It's important that you remember that. Because if we, if we didn't have, if we didn't think things could change, if we didn't think that we could make a change in our tribe or in our organization or in our company or in our nation or in the world, what are we here for? You know, we re you have no hope. So remember that you can make a change, right? And if you're committed and you're thoughtful about how you do it, you can help move an organization. You can help move a team to um, the next level. So that's the last slide. Um, the one thing I, as I've gone through this, I know I've mixed my terminology up a little bit for you, and I hope that wasn't too confusing. But you can apply the five levels of the trial uh, that we're talking about here, you can apply the five levels 
to an organization. You can apply it to a team. You can apply it to a division. You can apply it to individuals. And, and so if I, if I confused you a little bit as we were going through, I apologize, but it, it is applicable to each, it is applicable at all the different levels. It just depends on where you're, what, what you're trying to change. But remember, it all starts with the individuals. You can't change, in, introduce a, a change without starting with those individuals because the sum of the, the beliefs, the values, the opinions, and the behaviors of individuals is what makes up your corporate culture. That's all I got. We got any questions in the chat? Woo, Chris Daly. So uh, after Chris speaks in workshops, I like to give him a round of applause just to, um, that's me being a, a, a stage five individual and that life is great. Um, I'm sure you're all laughing. I just can't hear you. So um, a quick, uh, a few notes for you. Uh, one thing that really connected with me, uh, I'm sure you all agree, but that stage three to me is that classic micromanager or that helicoptering parent. I, when I worked at Indiana University back in the day at their career development center, uh, there were multiple times where parents would bring in their 22 year old senior to come in and figure out what they were gonna do for the rest of their life and get their very first job. And you could tell from the moment they walked in that they did not empower their uh, child to make decisions for themselves uh, because they believed that they were super great, right? And when I say they, I mean the parent, that they had all the right answers and, uh, and they wouldn't let uh, their kids figure out things on their own. So um, yeah. Living at first is really, really important, and Chris mentioned that, but that these transformations really have to start with you, and to be able to live first as a servant leader is really important. So, okay, so we're about out of time. Uh, a few notes from yours, Drew Lee. You're going to be receiving an email here very soon. It's going to have the slides and also the video replay. Uh, we put together a nice little one-pager of the stages of tribes. So this is not a um, prescriptive, uh, how do I say this? This isn't going to have, um, all of the, it's not the book. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have, um, every single thing you need to know regarding changing your, uh, changing your team, but it does give you, I, I think it would be good to print this out and to just, just have it hanging in a place that's very visible to just remind folks, hey, what, what, what tribe am I in? Um, what level, um, where can I go, right? Where am I at now? And where can I head moving forward to improve? So you're gonna get that little one pager. Um, also, in addition to the little freebie PDF, uh, I'm gonna send you a discount code for any and all of our upcoming courses. You know, a lot of what we teach, whether it be a specific prep, uh, preparations for um, roles within Agile or where it's more of the what I like to call the squishy stuff. Um, this idea of tribes is applicable just about anywhere. So as you see on this slide, we call that Vault. That's the name of our open enrollment program. So I'll send you a link to check that out and you'll have a specific discount code to sign up for any of our upcoming courses. Uh, speaking of an upcoming course, I will send you the link for the next session. Uh, which is going to be uh, the same time, one, uh, noon Eastern. That's going to be on May 22nd. And I'm going to be heading that webinar, and it's titled Embracing Humanity in a Digital World. So I have a lot of experience working in remote teams and working in co-working facilities. And we're going to dive into servant leadership, emotional intelligence, um, and how you can foster these sorts of ideas. Um, in a, in a remote setting. I, I, I don't think anyone's opposed to the idea of servant leadership, but you have to be extra creative and be really deliberate to make that work in a digital sort of environment. And then Chris put it up really briefly, but um, the, uh, I'm going to send you a link for the book as well, uh, the actual tribal leadership book. I'll send you a link to check that out on Amazon. Uh, it is a New York Times bestseller. 
which I think a lot of books are New York Times bestsellers, but that's still a, a pretty important thing these days. Yes, and uh, as Chris just mentioned, there's a, a good TED talk about it. So I'll find the link for that and send that to you as well. So that's all we've got for the fifth edition of the hashtag or pound sign, as Chris likes to say, Slinky Think Sessions. Uh, we really, really appreciate you taking some time out of your day uh, to listen in. And I will send you that email in just a little bit. Thanks once again. Enjoy the rest of your day and stay agile. Cheers.